I'm excited to welcome Kentucky head coach Kyra Elzey to the basketball podcast. Kyra has spent more than a decade building the Kentucky women's basketball program into a national power. For eight seasons, she served as an assistant coach and associate head coach for the Wildcats before being named the eighth head coach in program history in 2020. In just two seasons as the head coach, she's crafted an unprecedented resume. Elzey became the first head coach in program history to lead Kentucky to back-to-back -to -back NCAA tournaments in their first two seasons. This past season, Elzey led Kentucky to its second SEC tournament title in program history and its first since 1982, when it defeated number one South Carolina. The national prominence of Kentucky women's basketball over the last decade has been a direct reflection of Elzey's leadership. Kyra, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you today. Well, wonderful. And uh, wow, what, what a year you guys had. And, uh, you know, I mean, you've done incredible things with Kentucky since you've been there as both an assistant and now as a head coach. But uh, last year must have been special. <laughs> well, we made a run. We got hot at the right time and obviously went in the SEC championship first time in 40 years. Uh, that was pretty special. Yeah, no doubt. And the number one draft pick in the WNBA. And I don't know how many people watch, but Ryan Howard, I mean, what a player and uh, what a treat to be able to coach, I'm sure. I mean, she's a gem. Um, obviously, she's doing amazing things in the WNBA, the career she had at Kentucky. Uh, she's a generational type of player um, and uh, the best is yet to come. Yeah, that's fun. That's fun. And, uh, you know, Lynn Dunn, someone that we both know very well, she did this podcast a while ago, and uh, I had a chance to contact her just prior to this. And uh, I mean, the first thing I want to start with is that uh, for you as a head coach, you have not been afraid to surround yourself with very successful people as assistant coaches and support staff, right? Absolutely. I mean, you're only as good as your people. And uh, my mentors always tell me to hire people smarter than you and let them do their job. And I have been blessed uh, to have two Hall of Famers on staff with Coach Dunn and Coach uh, Guesting Course. And, you know, I've learned uh, so much from them. And, you know, you want people that can pour into you and, and make you better, but also your program. Oh, tremendous. Gail did the podcast as well, and she's she's a fountain of knowledge. And, uh, you know, Lynn, one of the things Lynn pointed out is just uh, she thought it's just incredible the commitment you make to building relationships with your players. And I know we talk a lot about that as coaches, but can you give us maybe some of the specifics behind how you go about doing that? You know, relationships are so important. You're asking players to uh, push themselves beyond what they think they're capable of mentally and physically. Um, and as a coach, you know, you continue have to put uh, pressure on them to do so. And I think relationships come in um, when they know you have their best interest. You love them for the people that they are and not just the basketball player. And when you have great relationships with them, you can have honest conversations uh, both ways. They can tell me um, things that I don't want to particularly hear all the time and uh, vice versa. Then you have honest um, conversations that need to be had uh, during basketball. And you talk about these conversations. Do you have a both a structured, scripted time where they come see you and then a lot of unstructured time as well when you work on these relationships and this communication? You know, I'm I'm probably outside the box. Um, I you like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't like just here is the time that you can come to my office and meet me. Um, because I feel like, you know, I was a player and, you know, when you go to the head coach's office, even if you're not, it's like, am I in trouble? What did I do? Um, so, you know, I, I want to reach out to them, um, not about basketball all the time. So that might be a text message. That might be, let's go grab a smoothie. Um, and I like to meet them where they are. Um, when I moved over, I realized I do not have a lot of time. Um, so I work out at the same time that one of the groups are working out. So that gives me time to be in the trenches with them but not coach them. And then I'll go lay in the training room for recovery while they're there. And let me tell you, I learn a lot of things in the training room because they're relaxed. It doesn't feel like they have to be on guard. Um, and then, you know, just a lot of text messaging, um, but building a relationship outside of basketball that they know that they matter. Yeah, those informal moments. I'm glad you shared some examples of those. And uh, you, you, you've mentioned this before, instead of a lot of rules, you have expectations. Um, standards are what you call winning tools. Can you just explain that a little bit to us? 
You know, I was, I never wanted to be that coach that felt like I boxed myself in. Um, and that also they had a manual of 500 rules. I just think that is just hard to keep up with. That's hard to manage. So I like to propose that there, there's a standard and expectation and how you carry yourself. And you know what this program uh, represents and how we want to uh, operate. And so they understand what the standard is and the expectation, and that is a non-negotiable. And now I have some basic rules uh, and the ones that I have, you will follow, but I, I want them to understand the big picture. It's a standard. You must carry yourself um, in a classy manner at all times. And that's academically, that's on the court or whatever the case may be. We're going to get into some of that as we go through, and we're going to focus a little bit on some of the goals. And uh, I love how you phrase this, commit to it goals, commit to it goals, and then you go three, three, three. First, can you explain this structure of this, of the commit to it goals? Well, commit to it. It's one of our uh, catchphrases. That's all encompassing. Anything that you do, um, you need to commit to it 100%, whether it's academics, whether it's community service, whether it's a tutoring session, they understand what it means. The catchphrase, you commit, you are all in no matter what. And that's for staff um, and players. Um, and the 333, Coach Dunn um, actually, actually presented that to me. Um, you know, when you move over, um, I was a new head coach. And of course, I wanted to fix everything. I wanted to do everything. And I was like, I need to get this in and this in and this in. And she's like, you are not going to have the time to do all of those things. So she and I met every week and she asked me this. She was like, tell me three things that you want to be excellent in your team, three things that you want your team to be uh, great in, and three things that you want your team to be good in. And I thought that philosophy um, really made me focus on what I wanted for that team. And so when, when I started planning practice, instead of trying to cover one million things, I could go back to my 333, which I thought kept me my uh, organizational uh, of practice uh, prioritized. I love it. It's a, it's a great way of structuring it and keeping you focused. And, uh, you know, so people know 333, there's three, we already said excellent, great and good, but then there's three things in each of those categories. And uh, if it's okay, I'll share the excellent first and maybe you can talk about it. Transition defense, disruptive defense, and then three point shooting that you want to be excellent at those things. So maybe can you shed some light on your philosophy and in, in, as to why those are in the excellent category. Yeah, and I, I must have um, typed this wrong, but it's actually transition offense that we want okay. to be excellent in, um, disruptive defense and three-point shooting. Um, we are up-tempo and fast-paced. Um, and we know that in order to play positionless basketball that we want to play in, at Kentucky, I don't necessarily want to put a one, two, three, four, five. So we have untraditional lineups on the floor. So scoring in transition, that is our first. We want to put pressure on the defense um, and not so much pressure on our offense to slow down and having to execute every time down the floor. So um, we want to create tempo. Um, and that's what we do in our transition offense. And then we're always been undersized at Kentucky, but being disruptive. So maybe we get out rebounded. However, we can balance it out because we're going to force turnovers. We're going to limit your possessions because we're going to turn you over. And then three point shooting, um, you know, in transition, when you have guards that can go downhill, it opens up the three point shot. And also when you have a Ron Howard, when we got in the half court, they could load up on her. But in transition, that's where she got a lot of her threes because we could push and she could run free for open three. So we challenge all of our guards 40 percent or higher so we can spread the floor and still be able to attack. Yeah. And, and that's one thing from watching some of your film that I noticed is that continuation of transition offense that led into what we call dominoes, which is you've got the defense in recovery and you keep them in recovery. And you guys did an exceptional job of that. And I thought, and that's got to be one of the reasons you shot such a high percentage from three as well. Absolutely. Great category. Uh, free throws, transition, defense, half court execution. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, when free throws, um, you know, they win games. That's the difference between winning and losing. 
um, but also how we play the style. We are in attack mode. So, you know, we want to get to the free throw line 20 plus times. And if we're going to get there, we need to be able to knock them down. So our goal was 80 percent um, and then transition defense. You know, we just had to commit to not protecting the paint, not letting people score easy uh, layups around the rim, forcing outside shots. Um you know, in transition and then half court execution. As you get down the stretch, obviously everyone's scouting you. They know your first option, your second option. So to be able to settle down in the half court um, and score when we need it down the stretch. It's great. And, and coaches, I'm going to dive into some of these a little bit deeper after we get through these because uh, there's some questions specifically, but uh, the good category is finishing through contact, rebounding, well, finishing through contact, um, that's for guards and posts. We just say when you, we have to hunt paint points and that's not just pounding the ball inside and finishing, but guards getting your feet in the paint and finishing. We need and ones. We need to be able to score through contact and finish. Uh, and it goes back to our style of play. Um, and then rebounding. We might not be excellent, uh, but we have to have the ability um, you know, to level out on the boards. And then uh, our on-ball screen defense, um, you know, how we play and our versatility, we need to be able to change up how we're guarding you um, in ball screen. So we might trap you. We might ice you and keep you on one side. Uh, we might switch just because we're big across the perimeter, uh, switch one through four. Uh, so we like to change up our ball screen coverage. I love that. And, uh, you know, I, I guess the thing that stands out first is, is is free throws and wanting to shoot 80% as a team. I'm wondering, what are some of the things that you're doing with your team to be able to get them to that level, which I've got to think has got to be at the top of the conference if you're shooting 80% from the line, right? Well, that's our goal. We did yeah. not get there. <laughs> we didn't get there. You know, we really struggled early on um, last season. I don't know if it was um, a mix of I didn't put enough pressure on us. Um, to make pressure free throws and us getting enough reps at it and, and making it a point of uh, emphasis. Uh, but down the stretch, uh, we shot well. But some of the things that we do, a lot of pressure free throws, um, pressure free throws, I might call them up before water break and I might call three names. And if you don't make it, you'll run a suicide or you'll run a 22. Um, you know, we'll go everything is against the clock and there's something weighing on it. Um, we might go one minute, 10 in a row, and you have to shoot your rhythm 10 in a row. If you don't make it, you know, you'll go to the baseline. So we'll, we'll change it up. We might start practice 20 free throws, 80%. If you don't get it, you know, you're going to stay after practice and make a hundred free throws. So we'll, we'll vary, but we put an emphasis on free throws. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I'm wondering then, as you talk about a disruptive defense, are you finding your your coaching in high free throw games because possibly you're def, you know fouling a little bit more defensively, being aggressive, but also well, attacking so aggressively on offense? Well, we don't want to foul a lot. Obviously, uh, you know, stay out of trouble. <laughs> but by nature of that, it is. So by nature, you know, you do foul as much, but you know, we try to call a lot of fouls in practice, whether it is. You know, because you have to find that they have to find that medium balance of I'm aggressive and disruptive without fouling. Um, and, you know, they hate when we blow the whistle in practice. You know, they were like, I was up in them. Yeah, but that, that that's foul. And so trying to get them to learn the difference between being aggressive and fouling. Um, and, and that's a fine line. Well, and that was my question, obviously playing a disruptive defensive philosophy and then how you practice that. So you call fouls in practice. We call um, a lot of fouls in practice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, especially um, if there's a certain player who's getting in foul trouble, um, you know, we'll really make a point of emphasis every time they touch someone or, you know, if they're bodying up or, you know, they're getting fouls in games, we'll call extra fouls on them in practice. And I'm imagining that process makes them aware that they're more in control than they think, because often players think somehow it's the official that has the control, but you have more control than you realize, right? Absolutely. And, and everything we do live in practice, um, we put a point value on fouls. So they don't want to foul in practice because it might be some days it might be plus three for a foul. So if we're scrimmaging and you foul, it's plus three and the offense gets the ball back. And, you know, they're trying to win in everything that they do, or we might do plus two for a foul, but there's always an emphasis on 
the other team is gaining points when you foul. So they're, they're cognitive of it. You mentioned that. So uh, maybe uh, what are your top three, if we put them in the excellent category, your top three analytics and that you love to check out? Um, you know, I really go to our threes. What, what did we do on our, our three point percentage? Because usually we've won big games when we were probably at that eight to nine mark mm. uh, hitting threes. We really, you know, had a successful night um, offensively. Um, and then I go right to our paint points. What did we do in the paint? Because, you know, we lost some games early because we were leaving 20 or 25 points on the board for missed layups and, you know, being able uh, to finish. Um, so those are two things that I look at um, automatically. And then I'll go to rebounding because it's, um, you know, you're not going to win many games if you're not in the same category or, uh, you know, we didn't have the effort that we needed to rebound. Yeah, it's great stuff. I just love these categories. Excellent, great, and good. Because again, again, you just can constantly come back to it as a coach to be able to help uh, direct what, how you plan and obviously what your uh, expectations are for players. And uh, uh, finishing through contact, maybe a few questions there just in terms of how you develop that. Having two young daughters, uh, 9-11 and now, I know that's one of those challenges initially is to be able to get them to understand that contact is good and uh, helping them do that. So maybe give us some insights that way. You know, contact is real good. I'll I'll tell this story on um, Ryan Howard right now since she's, um, you know, the rookie of the year, <laughs> AP. Um, but her freshman year, she could not hit a left-hand layup through contact to save her life. And it just drove her crazy. I was her position coach and we would just spend 30 minutes layups. But a lot of it is being on balance, the physicality and the speed in which they make you play at the next level. So balance. Um, so we work on finishing moves every day in practice, whether it's with your position coach or we do it in shooting um, and just getting used to getting hit and they're not calling a foul. It's not a foul. Make the play and just getting that mindset, but also learning different finishing moves. So we might do a speed layup. We will do a power or reverse, a hang it to the outside. So a runner. So we're doing different moves through contact every day. And when you say through contract, are they doing that through a teammate? Or are they doing that through a manager with pads? How are, are you? Uh, manager with game? pads, coaches yeah. with pads. I like when the coaches do it better. The managers, you know, <laughs> they, they take it a little more uh, easy on them because they're buddies with them. Um, but I like when the coaches get the pad and we're hitting them and, you know, making them finish. And then it's always, like I said, anything we do, it's a win or a loser. Either you achieved the goal or you didn't. Um, so we might say, you know, we're going 12 in a row on contact layups. And if you we don't get it in this time frame, we don't call um, consequences at Kentucky. We call it developments, mm -hmm. uh, opportunity to get better. I love that. Love that. Any way to phrase it in a positive light. And yeah, so an opportunity to get better. Yeah, and exactly. So We'll just work on it. And so uh, they do understand. So those are things that they come in and work on because they don't want to be the one that are in the drills and we're not making them because you can't finish. Yeah, we called uh, consequences rewards. You're being rewarded because you need yeah. to get better. You're being rewarded. <laughs> yes, you're being rewarded. And yeah. then I tell them if you can do it in practice um, and finish through obviously what is a foul, we're fouling you on purpose, then you're not begging for calls in games. It's just a, if, if I'm, you foul me, I'm going, I'm and one, I'm going to try to shove it through your nose. Um, and if they call it, we still, and one, let's get up there and make a free throw. So just setting the mentality. Yeah, you're normalizing it for them. That's great stuff. And uh, offensive outlook. I mean, we talked a little bit uh, about this already. You want to be really good in transition offense and uh, talk to us about your first wave concept. Uh, again, I love that phrasing of first wave. You know, our first wave is we want to attack. Um, you know, we want our wings to sprint to the baseline. Um, you know, if the ball goes through the net, um, you know, we want to get the ball out of the net. It should be one, two. Our uh, point guards are curling out. We want to catch it on the run and attack. Um, and the person who takes the ball out, which we call our trail post, uh, we like when they're versatile um, because then we can swing it back to shoot a three. But 
we have so many options out of our first wave. You know, we have ball side op options and then you have weak side options and it's a read, whatever the defense does, you know, we, we use one of our reads. So we spend pretty much every day um, in some capacity working on our first wave offense. Are you finding from team to team, especially in the SEC, are there different emphases for your first wave, depending on how a team defends in transition? Absolutely. And that's why it's a read, um, because we have different options out of it. So maybe they're loading up on ball side because they don't want us. Then we'll slice the floor and then we have options weak side or, you know, maybe they are bigger than us and we want to pull our post out. Then we'll go to the pinch post type of action. So we might throw it to our post. Um, you know, we might have some guards um, that are great defensively, and we might set the step up screen to try to free get, you know, allow our ball handlers to play downhill instead of being uh, turned uh, with a zigzag because you're against great defenders. So there's different options out of it. And I love how you've defined the difference between structured and unstructured offense, your term for unstructured offense, non-patterned. Uh, which I believe is what you mean by conceptual offense. And then you talk about pattern offense, which is, I imagine, more dead balls. So can you more just distinguish balls. those two for us? Yes. So our non-pattern, you know, um, traditionally we've went to a four out, one in. Um, and even though we've been undersized in the post, um, we, we've been able to move that post around. So even if they couldn't turn and score with their back to the basket, we could play through the post. So e even if I was a guard and I threw it to the post and started cutting off of them, forcing movement, um, you know, we've we've had a lot of success that way or bringing them to the high post and let us play off them. Um, we've always kind of been guard dominated um, here at Kentucky. Um, then we went to Chin last year, Coach G and I had discussed it and she installed it. And I thought that gave us, um, you know, some structure um, so they know what they were doing. Um, however, they could read the defense. It became reads. And I thought we uh, did a good job um, out of that. Um, our pattern sets, um, you know, dead balls or you know, we're trying to find a mismatch. But like I said earlier, we don't have a traditional lineup on the floor all the time. So it might be there's a guard. Um, we have a big guard in, but they have a little guard guarding them. So we're going to post them up or a team that's not good in the, you know, ball screen defense and the post is going to sag in the paint and we can kick back to a five that can shoot the three. So we look, we like to find the mismatch. Well, I saw a lot of that variability out of horns specifically, where you seem to have different players within horns and that gave you a lot of flexibility to be able to attack different matchups, however you want. Right. Absolutely. So, and, and that's the name of the game. When you play positionless basketball, you're trying to find, you know, the mismatch and where you can score. Can you give us an idea how you how you would switch horns? Because that's one of the challenges, obviously, like sometimes you call horns and traditionally the two players know who are in the horns action. But in your situation, it seemed like you did have different players. So how did you make sure they knew which player you wanted in the horns? Um, you know, it, you have a point guard on the floor that understands what we're looking for. So mm -hmm. I don't necessarily have to do it all the time. But, you know, going in. Um, to the game, we might say this is an area or player that we're trying to exploit. So when we go to this offense, this is what we're looking for. And, you know, one of the things that the staff and I did, I thought it really helped the players um, last year instead of, you know, you have so many plays, all coaches do. And, you know, you may, I want to install this for this game and I want to install and it, it becomes overwhelming. Um, so what we started to do, and I'm like, here are our pack. Here's our package. These five, we're going to start out of the gate with this. We'll run this second and this will be our main package. So we practice those um, and shoot around leading up to the game. And then I would draw up from there, but they had an understanding very clear of what we were looking for. And I thought that really helped them when we limited the package. And that's great stuff. And uh, you talked about making a read. So did certain players know in certain situations, whether they were a role or a flare based on whether, again, it was a post matchup or a perimeter matchup? Yes. So we talked about that before. So we would say, you know, in this instance, uh, say we were playing a, a Leah Boston who's talented and huge and athletic we might say we're not going to roll with if if you go to a Leah Boston side it's going to be an automatic pop 
and let's follow the ball and, you know, we'll stagger. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad you're sharing that. I mean, I've always kind of considered horns like pistols in the sense that it totally like it's the same thing just from the top as it is on the wing and a lot of variability and a lot of reads and you guys were really effective. So I really enjoyed watching some of your clips. Oh, thank you. Um, the other part that went, you talked about non-pattern. So I'm wondering, you talked about a chin or pinch post. So they're in first wave. And then at some point, are they flowing into potentially chin or pinch post then if the first wave gets to a neutral situation? And then if so, what are the triggers that trigger say chin or uh, pinch post? So we'll run our first wave and then our pitch post, we can actually run that out of our first wave. Mm -hmm. So they know that they can get into it. So if we, the point guard doesn't feel like she has anything and she throws it to the post, we'll go to the split screen um, action, play out of the uh, split screen, come off the ball screen, we'll pin down on the opposite side. Um, but if we don't score out of our initial action, we'll go to four out one in um, and then you know, pretty much 10 seconds or less, um, we'll go to the ball screen. But what we started doing last year, which we had a lot of success to get the people that we wanted with the ball late, we would go to our pitch post because you could get into it and have the people that you wanted in the triangle to score and the people that you wanted to pin down. So we started going to the pitch post um, yeah. late and what we started looking for um was the post up out of the pitch post so we could get a, a Jasmine Massengale or Ron Howard um, on the post up. So were they the passer or the receiver then in the preference of that? Say it again. To try and post them, are you are they the cutter or are they the receiver of the, uh, you're calling it a pitch post, right? A pitch post. So yeah. no, we would have uh, one of our fours or five, we would throw it to them mm -hmm. and then the guards would split screen. So one of the guards could curl off and post up. So the post could just dump it down um, because we were bigger than most guards. And then uh, one, the opposite guard would um, come off the hand handoff. So if the post didn't throw it to the post up, she would go dribble handoff and then she could pop, then the guard could shoot it. So that was kind of like the triangle action. Yeah, it's great stuff. And thank you for sharing this because like at the end of those, we call them butter possessions. Those we played FIBA, but it last eight seconds, last 10 seconds, those butter possessions. It's really nice to be able to see teams do something different than just ball screen, uh, which right. tends to bring two to the ball. And in your example, you have a lot more variability and a lot more decision making opportunities for players. Correct. Yeah, it's great. Coach, uh, with that pinch post, pitch post, these are gets, whatever we want to call them, the same term, different same ways. Term. But uh, I'm curious then, where did you get the terminology pitch post and why do you use that one? Well, I thought it was easier for our players to understand um, because when our, when our first wave action, um, our guards can call specific things. And so for them to remember, so we might have a gun action, we might have uh, a pitch ahead. So we wanted to stay consistent in what we were calling. And so while we call pitch post is because if they call pitch post, they know the post, we're going to throw it ahead to our post and play off that action. So to keep the terminology um, consistent. Love it. Thanks for clarifying. That's, uh, it's great. And, uh, you know, we'll go a little bit to the defensive side of the ball, because obviously you mentioned another one of your excellences uh, that you want to be disruptive on defense. And uh, can you talk about some of the different ways that maybe you do that? Maybe starting in the full court where uh, you use some run and jump and you use some different types of zone presses. Yeah. You know, um, last year I wanted to run and jump more, um, didn't have the depth and numbers to do so as much as I wanted to do it. So, you know, we kind of, but that's one of the challenges of having a really good player like Howard too, isn't it? That you don't necessarily yeah. want her involved in some of those things. Exactly. And you don't yeah. want to wear them out. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we started doing it dead balls or after free throws so we could pick and choose. Um, and then we have our, uh, one, two, two, um, press, which is a different type of disruptive because we weren't necessarily trying to trap out of it. It was more take time off the shot clock. And, you know, the funny thing is like, I would say, uh, our one, two, two back, but our guards were so used to pressing up, they would press up and try to trap out of it, even though I was trying to contain, um, but, you know, I would rather have them more aggressive than not. Um, but it also just took time off the shot clock. So um, about time when they start their offense with 17 and 18 seconds, you're limiting your time playing half court defense. 
Did you have a, a, a specific call for the one, two, two to make it aggressive versus like you can trap or you can't trap? Yes. We have specific okay. calls for that. So yeah, they know great. what, what we're doing. So they know in this example, even that, though sometimes okay. I would call it, they would just get so uh, aggressive out of it because, you know, especially if there was a speed dribble and it was coming, they, it, they just, it was instinct. So you got to let them play with instinct as well. Oh, good. For, yeah, absolutely. I mean, defensive decision-making is just as important as offensive, isn't it? Yes. It's good stuff. And, uh, you know, co complimenting that obviously is, uh, you know, your half court defense. And you talked a little bit already. Maybe just give us some of the ideas of your ball screen coverages and some of your preferences with ball screen coverage, especially in a great conference like the SEC, where I know you, you, you face some really incredible players every single game. Absolutely. You know, I, I think this conference is a gauntlet. As you know, it's super athletic, talented, well coached. Um, but our ability, um, to change up our ball screen uh, coverages, depending on who we played, um, I thought was a big positive for us. Um, like I said, we were undersized, but you know, being able to switch is disruptive because you're forcing the opponent to find the mismatch and make the read. Um, and sometimes we switch one through five, sometimes we switch one through four, and depending on who we had in the game with our fours and fives, you know, sometimes we might be like, we'll switch one through four, but we're going to ice with the five or we're going to ice with this particular player. And so our ability to be versatile, I thought was helpful defensively. And you mentioned that in some of the two, three zone stuff too, that you would ice ball screens in two, three zones. So there was that back and forth complementary nature of both ball screen coverages, right? Yeah, because some people think when you think disruptive, it has to be full court, run and jump. I'm going to turn you over every time. Disruptive might be a turnover. Disruptive might take them, you know, change the tempo of the game or, you know, change the momentum. Uh, disruptive could be, you know, they started their offense, not when they wanted to. Um, so we would go to a two, three zone. It might be just to change the momentum. And it might be after a timeout, we'll say, you know, we're going to trap the first pass and then, you know, play one possession and then we're back to man, you know, just to make them think. Love that. I love keeping the defense off balance with some of those things. And, you know, and it's really taking care of taking advantage of what a coach's tendency is to overthink the game sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we always. Well, I mean, that's what coaches do. We always overthink because you're trying to think about what's next or what your opponent might do. So I know you played for Pat Summit. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to put you on the spot, but maybe give me one thing that you took from having been around Pat Summit that has influenced you and your program and you and specifically as a head coach. You know, I would say her work ethic and her ability to be demanding, but not demeaning. She was going to get the best out of you. And she just had a special way of doing it. And you know, as the coach, you can't coach everyone the same. Um, but what I take, took from coaches, you have to be fair and they have to understand the difference. I mean, she's, she's the standard. I mean, there, there's not many uh, like her. And if I could be half the woman, half the coach uh, that she was, I'm going to be in business. <laughs> Uh, you are in business, Coach. You're doing an incredible job. And, uh, you know, an another thing that you said is if you can play for her and survive it, you can make it in the real world. Is that a mentality that you carry forward for your players to be able to develop this mentality that whatever you whatever happens to you in life, you can handle it because we've taught you how? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the thing about Coach Summit and the staff and at Tennessee, they made me the woman that I am today. And it was bigger than basketball. Obviously, we competed and um, but Coach um, forced you to have this mental toughness um, that no matter what happens, you get back up and swing. And so we're built that way. That that's that's I mean, any lady of all that you talk to, we are just built that way. And you have to have a resilience um, about yourself and be able to battle through adversity, um, remain humble. But, you know, it's the tools that she gave us to be prepared for life, women of life to be, you know, moms, to be CEOs, to be successful, you know, whether it was how to speak to the media, whether it was etiquette class, whether it was making sure you're on time how you presented yourself. And some of the times you're like, does this really matter? Does this really, like, really, do we have to, we dressed up before every game. 
No one ever saw us, but we dressed up before every game. But it was a mentality um, that she instilled in us. Yeah, it's incredible the the impact that a coach can have and continue to have on your life. And uh, I imagine a big part of uh, that and so many of your lessons as a player and now obviously as an assistant and then as a head coach, that you developed this concept of a culture player. And uh, can you explain that to us as well, this concept of a culture player within your program? You know, uh, a culture player, when I moved over, you know, you you think when you're an assistant, you know, this is the style I'm going to have. And, you know, I want to coach this way and here's how I'm going to do it. Um, But, you know, what I found is you really have to surround yourself with a staff, one, that has your vision, but also a group of players that can align and carry out the vision that you have for the program and play that style. So literally, I was sitting on a plane and So when I became the head coach, obviously it was a whirlwind on how it happened. But, you know, I just started texting the staff. I was like, while I'm fresh and before we play any games, I I want to put I'm a checklist type of person. That's that OCD in me. But I was like, here is exactly who I want to coach at Kentucky that meets the culture um, that I am trying to establish. And so I literally just went down a checklist of here. And if they don't meet these boxes, don't even bring them to the table. And I thought that gave us a clear vision of who I wanted to coach and who I wanted to be at Kentucky um, and who fit the culture in which we're uh, trying to thrive in. Yeah, it's great stuff. And like some of them, uh, like relentless defender, strong work ethic, high motor, you know, those are things. What's that? Coachable, coachable, but I'm just saying some of those first three and and coachable, that's a good one to add to that. Those, those four are kind of ones where I I believe it's a much easier evaluation in a way you can watch practice, you can watch game, you can see some of those things, whereas some of the other ones are a little bit harder to evaluate. And I'm curious how you approach that, you know, especially ones like toughness, mental and physical, you know, um, committed to their role and loyalty. Is that something that you can evaluate from watching them? Or is that when you have to do deeper dive into their background you have to and do their a life? Deep dive. You have yeah. to do a deep dive. And, you know, and it's, it's our job to make sure that we do our due diligence as far as we're talking to the parents and their circle, the grandparents, the aunties, the uncles, the AAU coach, the high school coach, anyone that's been around them. And if you talk to enough people, you'll you'll gather the information. And I think um, the relationship that you have with recruits, you know, I'll kind of go down the list automatically and I'll, I'll kind of ask them different things. Give me a situation or a time um, that you had to establish toughness or um, you know, you wanted a certain role and didn't get it. How did you handle that? So I like to get on the phone and have conversation with them. And not that you're hundred percent right all the time, but you usually have a good gut feeling like mm, she can play for me or no, she cannot. Yeah. It's such an interesting thing. And obviously your evaluation has been bang on the, you know, the past two years and uh, moving forward. And some of those things are hard to evaluate from the outside looking in. But uh, as you said, it comes back to what Lynn Dunn said, your excellent relationships that applies not just to your players, but to developing those relationships with recruits as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, and having a rapport. And then, you know, it, it's hard for college coaches because at the end of the day, our job depends on wins and losses, right? And so, you know, you have to be able to produce. So it's it's real easy. And one thing that Coach Mitchell told me um, when I took over, um, he and I talked in depth a lot. And he was like, do not settle just for talent because in the end, you're still not going to win if they don't have the other intangibles and attributes that you are looking for because they will never be aligned with your vision. So maybe you go down in talent, but did they check these things and can you get them to where they need to be? Obviously it's, it's a mix of both. You obviously need talent, but you also need talent that can help elevate your culture. I love this. And I want you to, if you are willing to take us into the SEC tournament final locker room and talk about that, because obviously there's a combination of talent and all of these categories coming together in the right way, but they still have to be in that belief and that confidence in that moment. So take us through a little bit about how that process evolved for this team throughout that run. 
Well, you know, we had battled a lot of adversity. Um, you know, we had been injured, suspension. So everything that could possibly go wrong, it was like a mix, uh, a combination of all of it at one time. Um, but I had kept saying in the media, like, if we can get healthy, if we can get our players on the court all at the same time, you know, this team has a chance to be special. But I also thought, you know, even when we were in our tough time and we were losing, we still practice hard. So I could see our progression in practice, even though it was not showing up on the scoreboard. And, you know, we want immediate results, right? And we want to win right now. Um, but I could see us getting better. And I knew we had a chance, but also, you know, not going away from what we believed worked. Um, and standing your ground, no matter, you know, everybody can do your job better than you and they want to coach and you should do this and this. But I, you know, I was convicted in, you know, how how we were approaching practice and what we were doing to prepare for down the stretch. And, you know, that team practiced hard. They were competitors. Um, and, you know, we stayed the course and they believed that we could win. We had enough talent to win. And it's so funny when you think about, um, you know, we win on a last second shot. And it's so funny now that I think about it, we literally had done late game situations from summer all the way through. And down the stretch, it was probably January, February, Coach G and I were walking through the tunnel. And I was like, man, Coach G, I was like, we never win against our practice guys when we do our late game situations. And I was like, I, I wonder if we're ever going to score on one, you know, because in practice, I was all, de I was defeated because I was like, we never win. And we we're going through the tunnel. And she said to me, she was like, we're going to need it sometime during this season. And it's going to count. And I was like, well, I can't wait to see it because we don't ever do it. And Lord and behold. <laughs> what great we had, timing. <laughs> we had run that play or a variation of that play a, a many times and practiced it and didn't score. But we did in that moment. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful when it all comes together like that. And one thing I just want to highlight is that I love that this a barometer, even when your team is struggling a little bit, as you said, with whether it's injuries or different things like that, a barometer that they're still on course you said was that they're competing in practice. And I love that, that that's a great uh, connection for coaches to be able to understand. Um, I just wanted to highlight that. But the question I want to ask is these special situations where you couldn't score in practice, give us an insight in terms of how were you practicing these, were these special segments of practice or would you randomly call certain of these plays at different points in practice? How were you practicing these? You know, when coach G got on staff, this is why you have hall of famers. Um, I would tell her, you know, I was like, I always have the special situations at the end of my practice plan, but we never get to them because we either run over or something happens. And she was like, coach, you know, maybe we should start putting them um, before or after water break, just a two minute segment. We'll run over, you know, everybody, you get one shot, you know, and we started putting one or two um, in practice um, every day, or we would have a special situation segment and I thought during that timeout at South Carolina, we were, they were as calm and confident as can be. But when you look back on it, we literally had practiced it from summer all the way through. And so they had been in that situation time and time again, whether in a game or practice. And I thought they were really confident in what we were doing. That's it's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, do you need a new play this year or can you run it again? No, nah, well, <laughs> I'm sure we'll have new, new team, new plays, new players. Yeah. Um, but same concept, you know, we have to put ourselves as coaches in the situation, um, as players in the situation, um, because we all learn in those situations. And that's one of the things that I learned, you know, that when we are in these special situations, it's the heat of the moment, you know, you have to make sure that you are prepared, they have to make sure um, they're prepared along uh, with the staff. So even in practice, we rotate. So one time I might have the offense, Coach Butts has the defense, but the next segment, Coach uh, Smith might have the offense. So we rotate coaches as well mm -hmm. to make sure everybody um, is prepared for the moment. That's interesting. So what is what is part of that philosophy and then your mind? Is that that you're developing every coach in a certain way, but also that they have an appreciation for all of it as well? Well, you know, one thing that Coach Mitchell uh, taught me um, – that I really appreciate him for is he gave me the opportunity to put my hands on everything. And I've been blessed to work for a lot of people who have um, that, that gave me 
that gift. Um, and even though you think you're halfway prepared, when you move over, you figure out that I still have so much to learn, but that's okay. You're learning and growing. But um, for our staff at Kentucky, like I want everybody to have ownership. We are in this together. It's bigger than me. And there's no, you know, I want everybody to feel like they have a piece and I don't want to necessarily carry a practice for two and a half hours when I have a staff that's competent, that they have knowledge, you're hearing a different voice and that they know we stand as one. So all of my coaches coach in practice and they have an area that they're over. And not only does that help me and our players develop, but it also, it helps them as well. Um, I, I want to go back to the, I want to go a few places, but back to the special situation and, th and this play that worked at the end of the year. And you said you were working on it since the summer. What is also impressive is your belief in the play, because clearly if it hadn't worked a lot in practice, at some point you might say, maybe we didn't need a different play, but you truly believed in it, didn't you? Well, and it wasn't necessarily, it, it didn't work, but either we didn't make the right read we or we missed the <laughs> shot, we didn't score. So we didn't always finish. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the play itself could work, um, but we just didn't always finish. But, you know, that's that's part of practice and believing in your your system and what you have. Uh, that's great stuff. That's definitely a commitment to it and the, the work that goes into it. And then uh, and I love this that you brought this up, too. So I got to ask um, from moving over. Uh, give some advice to coaches uh, who are assistants that are going to be head coaches soon. I mean, you already mentioned the time constraints that all of a sudden more people want your time, including this guy who's got you on the podcast. So uh, <laughs> talk beyond this one and talk about some of the other things that you learned moving over one seat. Well, um, there's a lot that I'm, I've learned and I'm still learning. I'm going to write a book about my first two years, by the way, it's going to be a bestseller. Um, but <laughs> some of the things you learn on the job. There's no preparation for it. You just learn and figure it out. And so some of it's gut instinct. Some of it is surrounding yourself. But the number one, I would say, surround yourself with loyal, hardworking people that believe in you. And what that looks like is uh, if you're wrong, they don't mind to tell you. Um, they're there to lift you up. They have your back because it, it's just so much that you're trying to do. Um, the second thing is, you know, establish a vision and be able to tell everybody what your vision is and how you want it to look. Because there was a way that I wanted it to look, that I wanted it to feel, how I wanted it to sound. You know what it is, but you have to be able to it, articulate that. Um, the third thing is, I would say, you know, it's different when you're making suggestions to you have the final say. And it's just so much. So being able to delegate and let let it go because you have so much on your plate that you you must be able to delegate and let it go. The last, I would say self-care. Um, this job comes with so much scrutiny and the physical and mental toll that it takes on you. Um, so making sure that you make time uh, for yourself uh, and self-care. And then I would just say, continue to grow, be humble, um, because it will knock you down. <laughs> you thought you knew, but you did not, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. So, you know, coaching grace. And when you make a mistake, own it and figure out how to do better next time. We've, we've tried to represent self-care a lot on this podcast to understand that a lot of the portrayals of coaches don't need to be true. You don't need to be in the office from 4am to midnight. And that doesn't necessarily make you better at your job, does it? No. And I would just say, you know, I, I met with Coach Ross, who's a, a former coach in the SEC and an unbelievable coach. But one of the things that she, you know, she and Coach uh, Gail would talk to me about is like, you're used to grinding a certain way as an assistant because you, you're doing the, you know, let me do this to get it ready for the head coach. And I still work that way my first year and I was exhausted. I was mentally and physically exhausted where when coach Ross was like, you're still going to work hard, but it looks different now. It's more cerebral. Like they need your mind. And so you can't be so emotionally tanked and had made so many decisions that 
you no longer cerebral it because now when you move over they need your mind and that's what you know so i've really tried to you know focus on that using my people and really just doing the things that only i could do and coach mitchell gave me the same advice that's tremendous that's great insight coach i mean so many great insights throughout with uh, i mean the commit to it goals and then talking about some of these different things that you're developing now in the off season leading into the season what are what are some of the ways that you develop your players understanding of these commit to it goals at this point as you're moving into the season you know just play has been a phenomenal tool uh, for us it allows us you know when we are allowed to show our players um, you know, different practice clips um, with the emphasis on our excellent, great, and good. And probably um, out of the last year or two, those particular teams were so focused on how, seeing themselves visually on how they could get better. So um, we love just play and we use it a lot. So we're thankful for them. Yeah, it's an easy way to be able to direct these uh, this learning to your players. And uh, coach, I know another thing that you're proud of and uh, that, you, that is a part of your program is that you're built differently, aren't you? Absolutely. That's a slogan that we use, uh, built different often. And um, we might not be the most talented. We might not be the biggest, um, but we have to be built different. And that comes with the toughness, um, how we train, how we play, um, our mentality. Um, and so when, even when we're recruiting, we will say, if you come here, you better be built different. And, um, that that's kind of our brand that uh, a toughness. I love it. And, uh, coach so many insights. I'm so grateful for this time we spent together. Thank you for sharing the game with us. Thank you so much for having me go cats.